the session of, of, uh, of the talk is actually, um, if, if you want loyalty, that's for the dogs, yep. so something like that. Uh, so that, that's kind of co contrarian because loyalty, you'd think, would be something that's especially important for a high-end sure. luxury brand, right? Or you, and you've got a bunch of, of, of luxury um, brands in your portfolio. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, if it's not, you know, wh why, why don't you seek loyalty as part of your growth strategy? Very good. Well, first of all, if there are, if there are any loyal Hennessy or Moet or Clico drinkers, we love you. Um, <laughs> there just aren't enough of you. Um, so uh, for, for us, it really comes back to the consumer behavior that's uh, I think we all have. We, we drink across a repertoire of brands. Uh, and as a result, you know, when you walk into a bar, quite often you'll say, what are you having? And then you'll look at your friend and say, well, what are you having? Uh, and depending on the occasion and who you're with, you make choices. Uh, and one day that might be beer, and the next day it might be wine, and another, another day, and hopefully more often, it might be champagne. Uh, so in this repertoire, Getting, getting growth, it's really difficult to convert somebody from drinking, say, three drinks out of 10 is Moet, which would be fantastic, to drinking six drinks out of 10. So our, our role is really to get more people into, the, into our brands uh, and, and to make our brands really salient in, in uh, our chosen occasions where we want to win. So when we look at segmentation, we're looking at consumer motivation whether it's out you know, in affiliation when you're out with your mates, independence when you're making a statement or discernment or status. We're looking at a consumer motivation and that can change depending on the occasion, time of year, et cetera. And so, so, that, so that really drives our philosophy about uh, recruit, recruit, recruit. And we also believe that once you're into the franchise, it's a leaky bucket, I've got to recruit you again. Yeah, um, and so it puts a lot of pressure on us to keep bringing people into our brands. Can you talk a little bit about how you do yeah. that? Right. So if it's not through loyalty programs, it's, it's finding you know like-minded yeah. people. Maybe maybe take it from the top. What what is the the most important strategy that you spend the most time on to to, to lead your growth strategy? Well, I think it, it varies by by brands, but right. one, one of the things that sets us apart within the industry is you know my my previous role at. Uh, Diageo, we were very much an above-the-line, television-led organization. Uh, in the world of luxury, we're, we're about experience. Uh, and you can see the trends now about where consumers are spending their money in the world of luxuries, much more about experiences that define them. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our key areas is, uh, key areas are how do I create wonderful experiences that really immerse you in the beauty of these brands that have been crafted for centuries. Um, and that experience could be at the bar tonight. Yeah. So like, hopefully at the bar tonight. So it'd be like the perfect uh, glass of champagne or the perfect Hennessy. Or it could be scaled up to some of the events we do, for example, like our polo events we do for Clico, uh, where we've, you know, the brands really transcended the category of celebration is much more of lifestyle brand. So, and I, and I think one of the things I learned when I joined LVMH and joined Mert Hennessy was this obsession with quality of consumer touch point and experience. Um, and that's really the heart of what, what we're about. Great, so, so let's talk about those two experiences. Yeah. You talked about the bar tonight. Yeah. Uh, so the touch point, right, which presumably is with, um, well, I don't, I don't know where that, that touch point would be. So if you're at the bar, yeah. you're, you're ordering a drink, um, there's the perfect brand that's gonna, you know, gonna be serving you. So is, is it the bartender? Is it, this, this, is it the, the stack of drinks behind him or her? I, I mean, how does, that, how does that work? Well, if you think, again, our, our model goes, I, I need to be salient at the right time. So yeah. I, I need to be in your mind. I'm thinking about uh, a, dr drinking a, a cocktail. I'm thinking about Hennessy as part of that. But at the point of purchase, I've gotta be disruptive. So how do you become disruptive? Normally when you look at a back bar, it's such a sea of brands. Right. How do I stand out? Right. Win the gatekeeper. Uh, and we're doing more and more work now where we have, we've put people into the field. So we have champagne specialists, we have mixologists, we have brand ambassadors. And the mixologists and the champagne specialists are really driving education and confidence in a barman to s serve and how to serve our brands. Um, win the menu. 
be on the menu. I mean, some of this is, this is really old school yeah. marketing, be on the menu, because when I pick up a cocktail menu, if Hennessy's on the cocktail menu, I'll choose it. So let's, let's talk about that, right? So, it, you know, it's, you know, when I opened with that Phil's example of a coffee, and it, I understand yeah. you went to actually try and find the Phil's, Phil's coffee store as a result, um, where, um, you know, it's, 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 it's an offline brand. Uh, it's, it's a $3 cup of coffee. I mean, how, how much can you actually accelerate growth? There's all this competition. Um, can you talk about some of the technologies that you're using, strategies that you're using, like Phil has, for example, in the yeah. order ahead? I mean, you talked about getting on the menu. Are there, are there technology solutions to do that? Or, is, or, or maybe we can go to the Polo event, uh, which, which presumably is no longer in a static point of time, only at an event, but Correct. may have some social layers on top as well. well let, let's, let's start a little bit with Hennessy and the bar yeah. example. Um, when people think about Hennessy generally, they'll, they'll, they've tended to think about over ice in a big balloon sort of glass after dinner. And uh, the brand had sort of plateaued about two or three years ago. The Great Recession had hit our target consumer very badly. Uh, and three years on, we've now got record sales in the US. Um, we have a wonderful advertising campaign and, and a lot of work that's gone into the brand. But one of the things the team did through social media was to get people to think about how to drink Hennessy differently. And a lot of that was around cocktails. Think about Hennessy in a cocktail. Uh, and one of our most you know, sort of powerful pieces of social media recently was around Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. And we just ran a very nice little piece of work that said it, it's not about uh, Mexican independence and, and it's also not just about tequila. You can actually celebrate with cognac. Yeah. So things went through the roof. So, and that was that. Average, so, so you talked about social. So, how did, social, did, yeah. did, did, did you did you run it on Twitter or, yeah. or Facebook? Instagram, Twitter, it's, it's, Facebook. So, I think social media in that respect is allowing us also to change people's perceptions about how to drink a brand, <laughs> so that when they walk into a bar, they're already thinking about, um, you know, Hennessy as a cocktail, not as an after dinner drink. Right. And that's led to phenomenal growth. So that's, so, that's, that's, so that's great. Now, I want to address the elephant in the room here, which is that for, for the performance marketing, which you know, I think yeah. a lot of us are familiar with, you have a very difficult time because you can't, according to US laws, sell yes. directly. Um, so you can't actually have people click on and buy right, right away, I would imagine, Correct. in terms of an e-commerce play. Okay, so can you, can you talk a little bit about okay, how you're how you're getting around that. And so, I mean, I, I, so, so what I mean is, I mean, presumably Facebook has the ability to retarget people, and then you can use brand advertising through, through Facebook's yep. power of the, of the social graph to reach those like-minded people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, first of all, legally, we're not trying to get around it because that would be against the law. Right. Um, so we're not getting around it. No. If I, no. Um, and obviously, the three-tier system, which came out of prohibition, is still in force and, and very powerful. Um, Where are you based, in New York or London? Sorry. I'm based in New York. Okay, okay. Yeah. so you've got to watch what you say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, so it makes attribution and everything else difficult for us. So we, we'll run a lot of um, marketing mix, and I think an earlier person talked about um, classic marketing mix modeling. So we do a lot of that uh, around our, some of our bigger brands, so Hennessy, um, Belvedere, et cetera. And what's been interesting is that has not only reinforced the importance for us to step into new technology and new ways of communicating like digital, where we know at the moment we're under, underplaying it and we've got room to actually invest more, but it's also reinforced a number of the other aspects of traditional marketing, like television, like experience. We've just done a, a, a really nice piece of work around mapping the consumer journey with, with Shondon, one of our sparkling wines, uh, which came back and said, again, to the loyalty point, 4% loyalty in that category. So how do I get more consumers? Well, I have to have better shelf presence. They have to experience the brand in the past. They have to have had a recommend, well, it helps if there's been a recommendation from a friend. So we're now beginning to understand the different touch points and how we can actually influence those either through digital or through real experience or through TV. So, so you came on three years ago. Yeah. You were saying when you came on r roughly a couple of years ago that, that there was only 2% of your marketing budget being spent. 2% on digital. digital, yeah. And now that's within a couple of years up to, to 20% or well, so. Well, it's, in, it's increased because it couldn't go 
any lower. <laughs> it could have done, but it didn't. So we're now sort of mid-teens, and I think next year we'll be probably about 20% of our, of our total marketing spend. And can, you, can you give us a rough envelope what that budget spend is in terms of, in terms of millions of dollars? Uh, well, it's millions of dollars. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I, just, so, so, I mean, so you're seeing multi-millions of dollars increase on your budget, <laughs> right? Yeah, actually, we have, yeah. Can, can you, yeah. So, and, and attribution is difficult. It's yeah. broken. So, so how do you make those decisions, right? And, you, you know, we, we, we talked about TV um, yeah. in, in, in seeing, and, and I'd like to, to get to that, but, but why, how are you making these decisions? Well, where, where you go to TV and your marketing mix, how do you do that? Well, and it, 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 it varies by category. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the first thing, two or three years ago when you were, we were talking about brands, we're, we're also a very brand-centric organization, um, which is lovely. And, and the great thing about Moet, Hennessy, and, and LVMH is this obsession with brand and a long-term view of, of brand. So we, we, we don't engage in a lot of short-term tactical innovation or thinking. It's very long-term. Two or three years ago, we, became, we started to rebalance that with consumer. So rather than just being a brand push, you know, we're a, we're a luxury brand, the world will follow us, we started to actually really engage with the consumer. As soon as you win the argument that you need to recruit, well, who do you need to recruit? You need to recruit millennials. Then you go, okay, millennials, great. So, and you have to really understand them beyond just being millennials. Then you get into, well, 49% of them are multi multicultural, so you need to have a much bigger play beyond Hennessy on a multicultural uh, platform, and then you get into mobile. And you, you need to be in, into the technology, into the way that this younger generation is connecting with brands. So that was the first thing. Mm. The second thing on our big brands where we have more media spend, like Hennessy and Belvedere, the marketing mix work actually demonstrated, even though we were still learning our way through digital, it was being effective and we could do more. So that was a piece of fact and data that allowed us to say, let's accelerate. On the champagne brands, when you're about, traditionally about experience and PR and the budgets are smaller, actually digital and social media allowed us to amplify um, and scale that television in the past wouldn't allow us to do because we couldn't afford it. So there were a number of things at play that, are, that have really pushed us now mm -hmm. To, um, to really embrace new technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm really excited by the fact that next year we'll be actually testing two, uh, we have two virtual reality tests running. On, and, and for Mert to be doing that is you know, a major step forward. And I'm sure lots of brands here are, are already there. What are, you, what are you doing in virtual reality? Well, w one of them is around experience. So um, if you come to, a, if you come to the experience, how can I actually then take you somewhere else and dive you deep either into the, the event that's happening, but also take you to places that the brand would love you to see? Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of it. So really deepening experience. The other, the other brands looking at education. So um, we, we know that there's a lot of issues with uh, brand education. Quite often people can't, in the world of champagne, pronounce the name of the brand. Right. Excuse me, by the way. Yeah, so is it... I didn't realize that the T was pronounced. My bad for it, introducing Yeah, that. is it Moet or Moet? Moet. Yeah. So is it Verve Clico? Or, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. So technology allows us to start to tell our story in uh, a more engaging way than ever before. Great. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about the, the marketing stack, right? So, and, you, and you made fun of me, so we had lunch where... where John actually made fun of me for, for being the first person that asked him about what his marketing stack looked like. Um, I didn't, I just, see, he, I, he hasn't been to the, the Valley <laughs> very much. Or, uh, but you know, see, what I mean there is, can we talk a little bit about the technology you're using, maybe some of the agencies uh, that you're yeah. employing, right? And, and you talked about massive amounts of data that you're actually churning through, right? To actually see markets where television Campaigns have run, if I understand our conversation, right? Where te television campaigns have run, you, you, you factor out certain elements and see that actually there's been real growth there. Yeah. Can you talk about maybe providers that you're using, what your st stack looks like? And I'd love to tell you what my <laughs> stack looks like if I had one. Um, <laughs> well, so, okay, but, seriously. One of, but one of the, um, <laughs> what, one of the um, big questions we got asked, uh, Hennessy is, is 
growing rapidly. Yeah. So of course the question from Paris is why? What's driving growth? And we were very clear about here are the, here are the at an outline stage, here are the drivers of growth. You know, the economy's improved, unemployment's down, um, brown spirits are on fire, our, mar our marketing is better, our sales execution is better, our investment has gone through the roof. You know, Paris is really, really confident in the US and what we're doing. So we could put all these together. We could talk about uh, source of volume. So we could say we're actually seeing premiumization, so people coming into Hennessy. Uh, we're also losing to other brands as people move out of Hennessy into uh, higher end whiskies. So we could map that out. We couldn't map out which parts of the, the marketing mix are really driving it. So hence the marketing mix modeling. And now, you know, we're now stepping into a big data test. Um, and that's been up and running now uh, for about eight months. And we're going through the initial stages of really getting into the data and looking at that by, battle, we call them battlegrounds. Um, on all our brands, we're, we're not so interested in winning everywhere in the US, but winning in the core markets that we want to win in. So what we're hoping to get out of this big data test is actually the predictive nature, if I tweak this or tweak that within my marketing mix, or if this happens to the economy, these are how these different markets will respond. And, you, and, and, and to get into the marketing stack specifically, so you, you were talking about actually using our, our IRI research? Uh, yeah, we use, that's the market, marketing mix. Is it particularly analysis. particular magic around that, or is it just it's a standard that you've, you've uh, got to use? That's classic, yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah there's okay. no, Native. I, I would say there's no magic. They'd say there's a lot of magic yeah. in it. Okay, so uh, some, some native advertising. Yep. Um, you, you mentioned you've experimented a few, a few in a few places. Can yep. you talk about the results there? And it sounds like you were using Vox Media. Why, why Vox well, and, and what were the results? Well, let's, uh, again, this, this on the brand, Hen Hennessy. Um, and Hennessy three or four years ago was you know, in decline and its consumer base was getting older. Uh, and actually, um, we, we went out, and it's slightly before my time, a, a very, very talented marketeer, uh, Rodney Williams, went out and said, there's one thing we need to do on Hennessy, and that's um, get the swagger back into the brand. Um, and we, we built a very holistic plan around Hennessy, but the core to it was a big idea. Uh, and we had this conversation at lunch around, you can have lots of data and lots of you know, uh, information, but for a brand, having a big organizing principle, a big idea, is really important, and, and ours is never stop, never settle, mm -hmm. which is about pushing the limits of your potential. You know, never, ever give up, which is a little bit, it comes from the philosophy of Richard Hennessy right. uh, and how he lived his life. Um, what we then were able to do is translate that into a huge campaign, and as part of that, we have Naz as one of our major uh, spokesmen and influencers, and, and the relationship with Naz is great because he was rapping about Hennessy probably before he was legally allowed to drink the product. So this, go, this, this yeah. relationship goes back a long way. Yeah. And he's seen as very authentically a, um, a Hennessy supporter. Um, so what we, what we did, so we have the TV advertising, we created uh, a thing called Rap Monument, which was the longest rap uh, in history with uh, Complex and Vox and people. Uh, and that went out and had huge success. And um, the more we can do that in our marketing mix, the better. So we we'll still have our advertising, we'll still have our content, but creating unique content that is true to the brand and true to the big idea is critical for us. Great. Uh, so we've only got about 30 seconds left. You, you mentioned NAS and, and, and yeah. influencer marketing. That's a big trend right now. It just picked up in the last couple of years, right? Yeah. You've got. Uh, Kim Kardashian and Kate Kate Upton, and you've w w one of the things that we're going to be talking about tomorrow is from Yahoo talking about the move away from some of these big kind of yep. um, kind of mainstream media brands or movie brands and so on, and into to internet stars, right? YouTube stars. Yep. You've talked about with being being with Nas for several years. Can you talk about the lessons you've learned with certain type of influences, or where are you going with 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 your your luxury brand? Well, I, I suppose the question is, why do we do it? Uh, and we do it for two reasons. One is we have these brands. I mean, Hennessy is 250 years old this year. 
So we have these timeless assets that we're trying to connect with modern culture. Uh, and someone like NAS is a great way of naturally doing that. Uh, and I'm sure if you project forward that our, at the moment we tend to do a lot of work with sport and a lot of work with music, that that will change. As long as their audience is over the age of 21, you know, we, we want to connect with culture. Um, and we also now, we, we create a lot of um, um, pack designs and limited edition elements to our portfolio that will actually promote in select, selected clubs, knowing that influencers will, will go there. Mm -hmm. And we never ask them to Instagram it or to tweet about it, but you put some of these things in their hands, they want to tell everybody that they're there with this limited edition bottle of Moet, which is designed by an artist, etc. So it's beginning to change not just how we think about communication, but how we think about pack design, how we think about experiences like polo. So the whole marketing mix is beginning to evolve around recruitment, influencers, reach, getting more people, and being salient at key points. Great. John, we're out of, out of time. Thank you very much. Look Pleasure. forward to having a drink with you tonight somewhere at the bar. Great job. Thanks.